Um, so it's just basically what's gone over, uh, what's gone on in the church over the last year. Uh, there's going to be voting for new board members. Uh, there's going to be voting for the annual budget and just an overall state of the church. Uh, so we will have an update of kind of what happened and, and where we see the church going in the upcoming year. Everybody ready to worship this morning? Yeah. yeah. All right, but before we do so, uh, why don't you go stand up, greet someone, uh, and find someone that you don't know, and tell them your favorite restaurant in the Tampa Bay area and why that's your favorite restaurant. All right?
From the far side of the chasm, you held me in your sight. So you made a way across the great divide. Left behind heaven's soul to build it here inside. There at the cross, you paid the debt I owe. Broke my chains, freed my soul For the first time I had hope Thank you, Jesus, for the blood of God Thank you, Jesus, he has washed me white Thank you, Jesus, you have saved
us. If you have your Bibles, open up to James 5, verse 7. We only have two more weeks, and guess what? We are into Thanksgiving Christmas season. Man, like, that's like, wrap your brain around that one for a second. Uh, but before we get there, um, in the last, last number of weeks, I've been kind of just rehashing some things uh, to make sure we keep them on our mind about what's going on at the church, what we're doing, things that, uh, that the board has voted on that we're super excited about, uh, things that are going to be coming up over the next couple of weeks. If you didn't join the worship class, like after it got done, I asked the people coming out, like, how did Colin do? Let's, he's a teacher. Let's do a grade. And uh, they all gave him an A this Woo! morning. So that's, that's a good thing. But it's also a good thing. You know, we talk about worship, serve, and share. Uh, we're going to be having that worship class in the next two weeks. So feel free to join in. It's, it's a great class to kind of know what the church is. Not just about our mission, uh, but where, how we're going to point and direct that mission. And so with that, uh, part of that is to be able to serve. We're covering them all today. Is to be able to serve. And so next week, we have the met tent blessing. And so if you're wondering why there are cans on the stage behind me, uh, it kind of just gives it some uh, a little bit more significant reminder of to bring in canned goods, bring in some food to, to, to bless and to give others. This is a season where as we as a church congregation, as KCC, that we can help others. And so you can do that in a couple ways. Bring in some food. Uh, not just next Sunday, and it's kind of uh, when we do the tent blessing, but you can bring it in anytime starting this Friday when the tent actually opens up. But then also sign up, sign up to actually serve. You know, there's the old one, serve. So to serve, to share, to worship, and actually make that a part of your life. That's what we want to be about because that's what God has put on our hearts here at KCC to do. And so this is a great season to be a part of that, a great season, an opportunity to get and to actually do that. Uh, <clears throat> and so that's part of the where we're reaching, but another thing that we're going to be doing is also, um, we voted on, we're going to be uh, painting the outside of the building. And so one of the things that we need help in is this Saturday. This, everybody say this Saturday. This Saturday. This Saturday. This Saturday. I know, it's great. Uh, from like 8 to 12 in the morning, we need some help uh, pulling a lot of bushes and trimming stuff back. So the... Oh, the 20th. <laughs> Everybody say next Saturday. <laughs> next Saturday, 8 to 12. I had it on my mind this Saturday. Uh, pulling bushes, uh, trimming a lot because uh, for the painting company to paint the building, uh, they need to have nothing actually touching the building. So they're going to be power washing it, making it look nice. It's going to look fabulous. And so we want to make sure we step up and do that. And so if you can help serve on that day, next Saturday, it would be much appreciated as we kind of do our church home improvement project. And, and finding many, many different ways that we can continue to connect with people in our community um, and, and welcome people on in. And so uh, that's my little talk for you this morning. But if you have your Bibles, let's read Scripture this morning. Um, and isn't it a great thing that God has given us His Word so that we can know how to live and, and be in relationship with Him? And so, uh, if you haven't been with us, we've been going through the book of James. It's in the New Testament. James is the half-brother of Jesus. And he's been walking us through. It's interesting. It's only five chapters. And it's one of those books, like, it's very powerful. It's, it's a lot of it's black or white, straightforward at you. Um, but what's significant about it, as we go through it, we've been noticing how often James kind of references a lot of things that his brother, Jesus, taught him. And he's putting them uh, in, in different ways for different audiences of, of connecting with them. And so that's what we're finding out this morning as he says, be patient. Everybody say, be patient. Be patient. It's a big interactive day today. Be patient. <laughs> and my, my, my mom used to say this to me all the time, Joel, be patient. This too shall pass. <sighs> COVID will pass. Mm. Be patient. Then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. And if you didn't know, like, just the, even this thought as we walk through this, this is, it's so important. I grew up on a farm, and, and I grew up on a crop farm. Corns and beans, beans and corns, which every, every year, or every second year, every third year, depending on the, the richness of the soil. But the patience, just watching the farmer go out, Day after day, week after week, checking on his crops, making sure that everything was fine. Like, it, there's a lot of significance that goes into that. As we read these verses, don't just gloss over them, but recognize the significance that James is writing here with about being patient. You too be patient and stand firm. 
because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who, who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear no not by heaven, nor by earth, or by anything else. All you need to say is a simple yes or no. Otherwise, you will be condemned. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you, Father, for this morning. God, we thank you for this time together, Lord, that we can uh, come before you, worship together, God, to discover more of what you're doing, God, in, in our own personal lives and what we're doing corporately together. God, the excitement of this season of Thanksgiving and Christmas and all the different ways, God, that we get to worship and honor you, that we get to serve you and serve others, God, that we get to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. God, I pray that we never uh, fall short in doing those things, that we are not promised tomorrow, like what we wrote about just a few weeks ago, but Lord, you've given us this day to praise you, and I pray that every day we wake up, we are reminded of that, God. So Lord, we love you, we thank you in your name, amen. amen. So Friday, it rained pretty hard, huh? Yeah. So it, it came down. It's like one of those days it came down and Friday rained really, really hard. And I'm driving. I was, uh, I was, uh, where was I even come, trying to remember where I was even coming back from? I was coming back from uh, Lowe's. I was doing some uh, house repainting. I have a, a honey to-do list for my wife right now. And a, I, I was repainting our house. I went to Lowe's to pick up some supplies. I'm driving up 41 up by Hungry Harry's. And there is a, a, a red truck coming southbound on 41, a white car in front of me going northbound. And the red truck started hydroplaning, went over, went over the median, went through one of the trees. You can see the dent right in like his front bender like wrapped around it, broke the tree in half, and flipped in the air about four or five times. And it literally happened right in front of me. Like, I've seen car accidents before, but usually from a distance. Like, the worst one I ever saw was in, when I was in college. It was just a single car that got hit by a, a, a truck that didn't even know it hit it. But the guy was fine. But this one literally went flipping in front of me as close as I am to Colin standing right back there. And I'm driving right up, and, and like, I'm, th I'm, like, watching this happen in front of me. And as it's flipping, coming towards me, it, it flipped and flipped into the white car in front of me going northbound. And this guy was coming southbound. And the, the white car spun out into the side. He flipped all the way over across the northbound lane into uh, up on the side railing of the northbound lane, lane going up. And I immediately stopped my car. About four or five other guys stopped the cars immediately. I get out of my car, and it's the first time in my life where I honestly thought to myself, this man's dead. Who's ever in the car? There's no way they just survived. The, this truck looked like it had been through World War III. And I, I'm standing there, and me and about three other guys run up to the car and are yelling into the car to see if the guy's all right. And we don't hear anything right away. And uh, we start kicking in his front windshield, and we finally hear a voice. Help. And it was amazing. Like, in that moment, like, you weren't part of, I wasn't part of the accident, but the adrenaline rushing through me in that moment of watching this happen, like, it made me think of, like, doctors and nurses and, and, and people who were military, like, the adrenaline that could rush through you in those moments. And we kick in the front windshield. I, I, and I mean this honestly. This is not me just saying for dramatic. I honestly, before he said a word, I thought he was dead. Because if you would have seen this car, you would be like, there's no way someone survived. Because I literally saw the truck flip like in air flip in front of me four or five times and just crushed. Now, it's, it's a great advancements of modern technology because when we kicked in the windshield, he had airbags that flew up on every single side of him. And with wearing his seatbelt, kids, this is why you wear your seatbelts, because I tell my sons all the time, what's the first thing you do when you get in the car? Put on your seatbelt. The man walked out without even a scratch. Oh, my God. Oh, it was. And it was interesting, like, uh, we stayed there for a while, me and another guy, and talked to the, the police and the firemen, and his wife came running up and uh, just saw, she was actually driving southbound and saw it. Oh, oh my God. I, I mean, can you, like, just, it's one of those things where it's like, I, I can see it, but, like, where your heart would be, like, inside, like, your stomach, at that point, seeing, like, that's my spouse's truck. 
she comes running up and she just gives me and the other guy a big hug. And I'm like, <laughs> that, that is by the Lord's grace that he is still here. You know, it's interesting, that, like, and even as I like contemplating that and seeing it firsthand, because that was the closest I've ever even been to a car accident in that, in that capacity of seeing. Like, we're not promised tomorrow. We said this a couple weeks ago, scripture said this, James wrote this, we're not promised tomorrow. What you do today as a person does matter. And here's the thing, and this is something to be reminded of, it matters most importantly to the Lord. Like, he's the one telling us. Like, we read something like that in the book of James, because Old Testament and New Testament, we believe all scripture is inspired by the Holy Spirit. And so when we read that, that is God saying it matters to him. And so when we read through the book of James, when we read through the book of 1 John, like, our, like we did last year, when we read through scripture, like, we're to look at it and say, this matters to God. Like, he, he wants your heart, you matter to him. And I'm reminded, like, when we read Scripture, we know the truth of what it says for our lives. We're protected like airbags in the sense of God's hand protects us. Scripture actually says that. He doesn't let you go. He keeps you in his hands. And so it's so important as we read through this to understand what does it mean when James says, patiently wait. He saying patiently, he even says at the end, patiently wait for the Lord's coming. Now, now, on Friday, I thought the Lord came pretty quick. Like, it made my heart skip a beat. But the idea of this, this patience is to wait for a long time without becoming annoyed or upset. Who's the expert in here that can do that? <laughs> to wait for a long time without becoming annoyed or upset. You know, the Greek actually uses kind of two terms for this. It's macros, which means long, and thumos, which means temper. And it's saying long temper, or how we translate it today, which a lot of Bibles use, long suffering. Interesting. You know, you never realize how patient you are until something is wrong. If, you're, if, if something is good, you don't really consider it patience because it's good. And so it says long-suffering, as we see it in Scripture, is having this temperament or the ability to wait for a long time without becoming upset or annoyed. I mean, did you hear that? There's a lot of us that say we have patience, but there are not a lot of us that actually practice patience. This meaning, this meaning gives us this understanding that it means bearing insult or injury without retaliation. Hmm. And so we pray for patience, but is it something that is given or something that is uh, practiced? I always ask the Lord for patience. And surprisingly, God always gives me opportunities to be patient in. Amen. And don't you love it when people tell you to be patient, especially when you're not in the, in the mood to hear it? <laughs> <laughs> Just be patient, Joel. That's... That's, the, that's those moments when you want to look back and be like, me be patient, you be patient. <laughs> I mean, we think, we think of that kind of stuff. And when he, so when he says, like this opening line, he says, be patient. It's like, do we really have to be? Yeah. We want our computers to be fast. We want our phones to be faster. We want our cars to be even faster. We definitely want our Wi-Fi to be the fastest. Yep. And even those who like Starbucks want it to be fast as well. Amen. Right? <laughs> I texted Colin this morning. Colin, where are you at? I'm in like getting Starbucks. <laughs> be fast. Like we, we have these desires, but then we're called to be patient in all things. It's like when you're at a stoplight and you don't go right away and the car behind you honks their home. Oh. Or, you know what I want to do when someone does that to me? I want to put my car in park. <laughs> get out of the car. I want to walk back to them and say, do you have an issue with your horn? <laughs> Can I help you with that issue? Patience, right? <laughs> well, if they're not going to be patient, why should I be patient? See, we often think of patience in that, way, in that light as well, too. I mean, think about what I just said. We're upset because they weren't patient, but look at the lack of patience of our own. 
And so oftentimes we justify it with that as well, too. Well, if they don't, and we love pointing the finger, don't we? I mean, I love the way James starts off in addressing here. Be patient, brothers and sisters. He, he, he's addressing the whole crowd in multiple different ways that we're going to dive into this morning. He's like, all of you, not just some of you. All of you. Look at the opportunities God gives you to be patient. James 1.19, unless we forgot, says, My dear, dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. You know, is patience a sign of spiritual and emotional maturity? Is it a sign that we have really taken to heart what the Bible says? Did we remember that a few weeks ago, or did we just gloss over and say, oh, that's for other people? The Bible tells us about God's patience. In 2 Peter 3.9, it says this. It says, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness, Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. That verse right there, you could do an entire seminary class on. Why? Because I know this because I took a seminary class on. <laughs> this whole portion about God's timing. It is amazing to think about this. In that verse, that the Lord's not slow in keeping his promises means God's always got his timing. He will always keep his promises. That his timing is not our timing. That's a big one, FYI. That's why it says be patient. We need to be patient. It says that it tells us that he is patient with us. Praise Jesus on that one. Have, have you thought to yourself this week, Lord, thank you for being patient with me? I have many times. And then it says maybe one of the biggest ones that we need to understand about why we even have this share over in our mission statement. Not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. God wants all people to come to know him. Why, why do we do church? Why do we share the gospel of Jesus Christ? Why do we help metropolitan ministries? Why do we have second servings? Why do we support people like, uh, like Oasis and, and Living in Faith and Cornerstone? Because he wants all people to come to know him. And in the midst of that, we are to be patient while we serve. Man, this is such a big thing. Look at Galatians 5.22 when it talks about the fruits of the Spirit. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. Hmm. That forbearance is another word for patience. The King James Version actually says love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness. So James just got done talking Remember the last couple of weeks about the rich not oppressing the poor and being humble about what God has blessed you with. But now this week, as we dive into this portion of scripture, James is talking to believers and the poor about being patient for God's coming. You know that sometimes you're going to be persecuted. There's going to be issues in life. But just know that we are called that in the midst of those persecutions. We have to connect with what we're reading this week with what we've been reading. It doesn't just stand by itself. It's in this whole book, in this whole letter, what James is writing. As we go through suffering and, and persecution from all those that could be around us, he says, be patient in waiting for what God is going to do in his timing and in his timing alone. Well, that's a really difficult thing to do. And so I want to break this, this first part down a, a little bit. And this first part, it, it, it's the patience for the Lord's coming. You notice here in, in three of these verses, it says it three times. Actually, is what it talks about, be patient in the Lord's coming. It says, be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield, to yield its valuable crop. Patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too, be patient and stand firm. Because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. You notice it says three times here, it talks about the Lord's coming. Verse 7, it says, until the Lord's coming. Verse 8, because the Lord's coming is near. Verse 9, you can go ahead and flip it for me back then. I did not put that in. I thought I did. But it says, verse 9, is the judge is standing at the door. It says it three times. The Lord's coming because the Lord's coming is near. The judge is standing at the, at the door. What do you think James is trying to get across here? I mean, much as this three times, we see the precedent James is making in this portion of the passage, passage is that God is coming. When? Only he knows. 
But in the meantime, we are to live our lives as if we're waiting anxiously for him to arrive. You know, I'm, I'm often thought of what, it, what does it mean to live anxiously waiting for the Lord? We talked about this before, but it all, it, it, it's like a father or a mother coming home and, and your kids run to the door, like anxiously waiting for you to come home. You see, that's what Scripture describes as God's love for you and I. It's the prodigal, the story of the prodigal son, where he's off in the distance, and the father is just waiting for him to come home, longing for him to come home, patiently waiting for him to come home. That's the way God looks at you and I. He's longing for you and I to come home, and he wants more of us to come home. So if you've ever asked the question, why doesn't God just come back now? Well, Scripture answers it for us because he's waiting for more to come to him. I've been convicted over, over this passage the last couple of weeks as I've been reading through it because I've often thought to myself as I've gotten older, God, and, and I'm going to kind of tell you why I feel this way for myself, is saying this selfishly, God, just come back now. Have you ever thought to yourself, God, you can come back right now and be happy? On one hand, like I've said it, we say it meaning well of it, but on the other hand, as we see in Scripture, that God is patiently waiting, that he's looking at the bigger picture, longing for more to come to him. If you've ever wondered why God hasn't come back right now, that is the number one reason why. There's no other reason bigger than that. He is longing for more to come to him. He wants more to come to him. If you wonder why, as a church, we put such a precedent on serving metropolitan ministries, all these other organizations that we serve, why we push it so hard, is because he longs for more to come to him. Why bring him through next week? So we can serve others and show them the love of Jesus Christ so more can come to him. These are important things. We just don't talk about them. We want to practically do them because God wants more. Hmm. You see, I believe Jesus could come again even while I'm preaching right now. Wouldn't that be awesome if Jesus came and be like, hey, what were you doing when Jesus came back? I was in church. <laughs> it's better than saying I was at the bar. <laughs> or maybe the other place. I, you know, like, it, Jesus could come back at any time, but his, it's his timing. I mean, we're, we're told we don't know the day or the hour, but we're told to keep watch. Matthew 24, 36 and 42 says this, But about that day or hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. And later in that passage, he says in verse 42, he says, Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But keep watch. Be ready. That's why Scripture says in 2 Peter 3, 8, it says, With the Lord a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. When you are not, can we just look at the bigger picture here? Like for God, as much as our brains can wrap around this. When you are not controlled by time and you are the inventor of time, can you just think about the significance of what living in an eternity with God could even be fathomed to be like? I mean, for God, it's like, oh, there it goes. And so we wonder, like in Scripture, when it talks about be patient, because we're finite. And our life is like a flash, gone. And Scripture asks us over and over again, what significance in our life have we done to say, God, like, you have given me your Scripture, you gave me Jesus for my sins, and God, I did nothing with it. Is that, is that where we want to be when, when life comes up? Or is, do we want to go before God and say, God, like you gave me these opportunities to be patient. You gave me these opportunities to love and to share. You gave me these opportunities to serve. And man, I took every chance and every opportunity I could. That's what James is writing about here. And so when God tells us to be patient, to be long-suffering, he really means it. We don't know his timing, but we trust his ways. The second portion of this is, is simple. It, 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 he gives us these examples of patience. So he talks about this patience for the Lord's coming, but then he gives these examples. And he gives us three examples here in the scripture. 
The example of the farmer in verse 7, the example of the prophets in verse 10, and the example of Job in verse 11. And notice here, these, the, these three references, they cover everyone. The poor, the rich, the holy. You see, the farmers, even during Jesus' time, weren't known to be rich. But they were the average, everyday working person. The prophets were known to be holy, so everybody went to them. And even they, as the holy men, had to be patient. Job, who he gives us the example in the Old Testament and what it would look like to practically be patient in the midst of all types of turmoil in our life. You see, the farmer in, in James 5, 7, he says this, Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring. You know, I, I said before, I grew up on a, on, on a farm when I was younger. The first uh, 13 years of my life, I lived on a farm. I got to see firsthand how farms work, the back and forth, the, the ins and outs. You want to talk about, like, perseverance? You want to talk about patience? You want to talk about hard work? Go buy a farm. Because I, 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 I've told my boys, and I, like I be, even used to being a youth pastor and college worker, like you know nothing of hard work unless you worked on a farm. Bailing hay, going on the crops, like it is, it is physically taxing to your body. And so when he says be patient, when he says be long-suffering, let me just tell you, the farmer knows what it means to be long-suffering. While he waits for his crop, while he is physically exhausted. And here's the issue that James is bringing up, that we are to be patient and long-suffering in the midst of no matter how you feel. Because the farmer, let me just tell you, every night when they go to bed, man, they're ready to go to bed. Because they worked hard, and they are physically exhausted. They have given everything they have for what the Lord has given them. It calls me to ask, as Christians, do we go to bed saying, God, I have physically, emotionally, spiritually given everything I have for you today? In that way. He gives us this example. He says, that sounds, and it sounds a little bit like we're... we're this idea of what James is drawing us here is this trust in Jesus. It takes patience and trust that Jesus will be true to his word. That if I'm going to go to bed every night exhausted, if I'm going to go to bed and say, God, give him my all for you, that I'm trusting God will be true to his word. So why are the farmers willing to wait? Well, their fruit is valuable. The harvest is a process and it's to establish their hearts. They give this, this understanding. That's why they're willing to wait. It's because of what God does. And then he says the prophets in James 5, 10, 11, he says, Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have per been uh, persevered. You see, the farmers are working, but the prophets are witnessing. What we do until the Lord comes back or what do we do until the Lord comes back? James gives us an insight here. We work and we witness. As believers, we're called to work and to witness. You see, when God kicked Adam and Eve out of, out of the garden, what's, what's the job that he gave them? Anybody know? To work. To produce. We work and we are to be a witness for him. He's blessed us with this earth to take care of, to work on it, and to witness for him. There's this quote that I, I like that I've read the past several weeks. It says this, The will of God will never lead you where the grace of God cannot keep you. And it's so important that we understand this when it comes to being patient in long-suffering. When it comes to God's timing and not my timing. When it comes to saying, God, you first me last. And so they patiently kept witnessing even though they were long-suffering. The, the farmers, the prophets, and then it comes to Job. Who here knows the story of Job? Job had a hard life. If you didn't know the story of Job, Job, oh, that, let me say that, like he, it's a double-edged sword. He had a great life. But he had this moment in his life 
But you can say, well, I, I just give up. James 5.11 says, have you heard of Job's perseverance and have been what the Lord finally brought about? The Lord is full of compassion and mercy, and it's this story of patiently enduring heartache after heartache that Job goes through. You see, Satan goes before God, and God goes to Satan, where have you been wandering? And Satan looks back at God, and he goes, I've been wandering and looking for people to devour. And, and Job has nothing to do with this conversation, and God even brings it up, and goes, well, have you considered Job? If you're Job, and you were like a fly on the wall, that's where you come off the wall and become human and say, don't point me out. But God does, does it anyways. If you know the story of Job and where it goes, Job lost everything. Everything. Property, servants, crops, livestock, children, all, his kids all died. It was in one day, servant after servant came back to tell him, You've lost everything. Your kids are dead. Your crops are done. Your cattle's gone. His wife even looks at him and says, just curse God and die. You obviously have done something. His three best friends come and tell him, you've done something wrong. It's your fault. Job is one of those people who had, humanly speaking, you would think he had every right to say, God, why me? Because in the midst of it, he had it sinned. But in the midst of it, he does sin because he does one thing that God says this to him. Who are you to question me? I made the stars in the heavens. Where were you when I formed the planets in the sky? Where were you when I set the foundations of the earth? And he gives a perspective to Job that I think we all need to have as James is writing here about being patient for God's timing, for God's coming. Where were you when God put the foundations of the earth together? See, in one way, like we, we look at God and say, God, you owe me an answer. But the truth of it is, God does not owe you or I an answer. He has blessed you and I with everything. And when he says to be patient and wait for his coming, in the midst of all circumstances, he gives us, James gives us three examples of what it means to be patient in all circumstances. He gives us this practical choice. And then here at the end, this last portion, he says, it, it talks about, and I kind of label it as this, hold close your integrity. James 5, 12 says this, Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. All you need to say is a simple yes or no, otherwise you will be contempt, condemned. You know, integrity lies close to the heart of the kingdom of God. I want you to think about that. Our character, our integrity, lies close to the kingdom of God. James here is not speaking about uh, against bad language about how we speak with bad ladies. You know, he, he's more or less saying this about oaths. He's like, you, don't, you should not have to make an oath because if people know you to be an, an, uh, uh, an upright person and people know that you have integrity, then they will trust your yes is going to be a yes and your no is going to be a no. And why do we find that as such significance today? Well, look, look at how many lawyers we have today. <laughs> if you're a lawyer, nothing against you. I'm glad, I'm glad you're around but it's the truth. If people would make their yes a yes and their no a no, would we have need of lawyers? And so he says, be a person of your word, and you won't need an oath. It's interesting. I'm going to read this portion in Matthew 5, 34 through 37 as we wrap up this morning. It says, but I tell you, this is Jesus saying this. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all. Remember, we talked before at the beginning of the sermon how James reflects a lot of what Jesus has said. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or, or, footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And really quick before we read 36 and 37, back, FYI, back then, Old Testament times, even leading up to Jesus' times, this is what they would swear by. This is what their honor would be about. They would swear by these things. And so he says this, And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one here white or black. Some of us want a little bit more 
black in our hair. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil. James reflects that, and he writes this too here in verse 12. He's like, look, just let your yes be yes and your no be no, and be a person of integrity while you wait patiently for the Lord's coming and for the Lord's timing, even in the midst of this day. And as believers, we're called to have integrity as we patiently wait. You know, the theme of Job, I was thinking about this earlier, the theme of Job is not actually suffering. The theme of the book of Job is this. It, it is God worthy to be worshipped apart from the gifts he gives. Did you hear what I just said? Because what was the whole premise of Satan coming to God? Job only worships you because of what you have blessed him with. He only loves you because of what you've given him. If you take everything away from him, if you strip him down of his wealth, of his family, everything is stripped away, he will, he will curse you and not follow you. The theme of Job is not his suffering. The theme of Job is we you still worship him, worship God, even if you don't have anything. Whether you have much or whether you have little. That's, that's a big question for us to answer. You know who was on trial in the book of Job? It wasn't Job. It was God. Mm -hmm. Because Satan was accusing God that you're not worthy to be worshipped unless you bless people. If you give them everything, they will of course worship you. But if you take it all away, they will not worship you. And they will curse you to your face. That's the test Job went through. Job lost everything in one day. You think you had a bad day? His was monumental. His wife said, curse God and die. And Job's reaction was this. He still honored God. And Job said to his wife, in Job 2.10, he said this. Shall we accept good from God? and not trouble. James writes, as we patiently wait for the Lord, is it all about me? Or do I patiently wait for the Lord and say, God, what will you have of me today? Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a big difference in how we look at life. Remember, the most important thing about us is not what we have, or who, who we're with. The most important thing about us is what we believe about God. And that's the most important, significant thing in our heart. Job shows us that it's possible to worship God even in the midst of losing everything. And so when James writes here in James 5, 7 through 12, be patient in the midst of everything. I hope we get a, a new clue and a new understanding of what that means because it really comes down to is do you trust that God is in control? Because when we patiently wait, we are saying, God, I trust you in the midst of this trial. And I trust that you will set all things right. Never doubt in the dark what God has spoken in the light. We are called to trust God in all circumstances because he has spoken and he has promised that he is with us in all circumstances. Even when we patiently wait, for his time and not ours. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for this morning. God, we thank you that we can serve you, God, as we get ready to partake in communion this morning. God, to be to have a joyful reminder, God, that you have paid the sacrifice on our behalf. God, that you love us so much. Lord, it is amazing. And so, God, we are so thankful for all that you do, all that you are, and that we can patiently wait, God, knowing that your timing is perfect. Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for this communion that we're about to partake of. In your name, amen. As you get your cup ready, let's just spend a few moments in quiet reflection.
thinking about the times that we have not had our patience. Thinking about the times where we were under trials, we blamed God, and we're not waiting. that Jesus was betrayed. He took the bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body broken for you. As often as you eat it, do so in remembrance of me. He then lifted the cup he said, this is my blood, shed for you for the remission of sins. As often as you drink it, do so in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Lord, we confess that we are an impatient people. But oftentimes we are not willing to suffer for any reason and often turn the blame against you. So Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would do a work in us this morning to give us more patience, to give us the perseverance to endure, knowing that you are in control, and that everything is in your timing. Father, I pray as we take up our offering this morning, that we would joyfully give out of the abundance in which you have given to us. We pray for those who are still suffering this morning. Whether it be from a minor injury all the way to losing a loved one. Father, we pray that you would speak grace and love and peace into their hearts this morning. I pray that as we collect our offering, that you would guide us, that you would show us the light in the way to use this to glorify you. Lord, let this be an act of worship this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.